all European states are on one hand egalitarian democratic states, but also they are white supremacist states. And white supremacy flashes out of them. Every now and then it hits you. The person who was uh, reliant on the suppression of the violence over there to project themselves as amazingly wonderful and neat and beautiful and democratic, suddenly find themselves unable to do so and you scratch them and you find this authoritarian thing popping up. Welcome to the Big Picture Podcast. My name is Mohammed Hassan and today we ask, is freedom of speech a universal European value? Or is it reserved for some and not others? That's a question raised by Professor Ghassan Hajj, a widely respected Australian sociologist and author who last year accepted a prestigious placement at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. But just a few months later, he became the target of attacks by right-wing media in Germany, highlighting pro-Palestinian posts he'd been publishing on his private Facebook account and accusing him of anti-Semitism. Then things escalated. The Walt M. Sontag website then reached out to the head of the institute, asking them to review his tenure. And they did, terminating his contract suddenly, saying he no longer aligned with their values. But Hajj isn't going away quietly and is determined to take his dismissal to court to make a point about academic freedom. Germany has been a staunch and unflinching ally of Israel and continues to sell weapons to its government despite accusations of ethnic cleansing and genocide in Gaza. At the same time, pro-Palestinian voices within the country are routinely silenced, arrested, or forced to dampen their criticism of Israel. So what makes a country that enshrined the guarantee of freedom of expression and opinion into its constitution turn its back on its values? Sanhaj, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome to The Big Picture. Thank you for having me. I want to speak to you about the experience that you had uh, most recently in Berlin with the Max Planck Institute, the society, and uh, how it is um, an example of a wider trend that is happening right now in a lot of Western societies, but specifically in Germany um, with regards to Palestinians and pro-Palestinian voices. And I want to begin by asking you to kind of tell us the story of what happened, um, how long you've been in Berlin, um, some of the work that you've been working on, focusing on, uh, and then ultimately how it led to this uh, fracture in this relationship with a very uh, distinguished institute. Well, I mean, uh, it's interesting you say how it led to, because nothing I was doing led to. Uh, it was totally what I was doing. is totally disconnected from uh, what happened to me uh, at the Institute. Uh, yeah, I was invited to the Max Planck uh, Institute of Social Anthropology. Uh, do you know, sort of like there's many Max Planck's in in, uh, in Germany, Max Planck of physics, Max Planck of uh, chemistry, and there's a Max Planck society, the headquarters is in Munich. Uh, this is institute is in Halle, which is about uh, an hour uh, south of uh, Berlin. And uh, it, it has uh, three departments. Uh, uh, political anthropology, legal anthropology, and economic anthropology. And the uh, three directors uh, invited me. And basically, they said uh, each department is thriving. Uh, there has been some renewal at, at the Institute. But uh, we are not communicating much among uh, each other as as departments, and uh, I have a bit of a reputation for creating spaces of interaction, uh, which get published. So I've got 
like I create a, a concept or or something like this mm -hmm. and uh, ask people to start looking at their research from the concept. Like I, I bring people together around the notion of waiting, uh, then around the notion of uh, responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, the last book I did was about decay. Anyway, so they wanted me to do something <coughs> similar. Uh, and so I created space around, uh, it's very ironic now, uh, but it's uh, uh, around uh, the concept of anthropology of social repair. This is what I spend my time <laughs> doing. Uh, uh, the, the only thing that uh, hasn't changed for me when being Max Planck is that I'm quite a, a, an activist anthropologist on my social media as far as Israel Palestine is concerned. And then so uh, October 7 happens and the fallout from that spills into a lot of Western societies. Um, there's a lot of protest, there's a real feeling of upheaval in a lot of spaces in, in, in Germany as well. Um, and there then becomes this um, this feeling like the way that German society or the German government is reacting to it is uh, quite hostile. Yeah. What did you see happening around you in society when that happened? Well, let me say that I was actually very, very selfish uh, in the sense that, of course, when what you described was happening, a lot of my colleagues here in Australia saying, oh, how can you cope with this, mm. etc. And my reaction has genuinely been, look, I'm really having a nice time <laughs> at Max Planck mm -hmm. and I just, I'm going to take a break. I know it's, I mean, but I'm not going to involve myself more than I'm usually involved. So I wasn't participating in any, uh, uh, demonstrations or speaking at uh, rallies or uh, even uh, speaking on the issue. Uh, I, I was concentrating on what I was describing. As I said, very selfishly because I was having a lovely time. They loved me, I loved them, and we were just unapologetically bubbling yeah. <laughs> ourselves. Uh, but of course, I mean, analytically, my eye was always on on that. Um, as as a, as a, an anthropologist of racism uh, and comparative racism, I became interested the way uh, anti-Arab racism uh, was circulating uh, in Germany, and I was uh, looking at it carefully. But all I'm saying is that I didn't speak about it, yeah. or but I was very carefully looking at. And especially, I became interested with uh, the rather uh, exquisite uh, uh, combination, which is uh, a bit of a historical tour de force, really, uh, the way uh, anti-Semitism uh, becomes uh, sort of like subverted uh, historically. Uh, and uh, not only is it emptied of its original meaning uh, of uh, what it means to put down uh, seriously hurt uh, Jewish people, uh, uh, but to turn it into a more the racializing uh, Arab people uh, in in Germany. So I became fascinated because it's well. The more you think about it, I mean. It is genuinely, as you, as I said, a tool to focus to actually take a category like anti-Semitism, which was directed as an anti-racist, anti-anti-anti-Semitism, as an anti-racist uh, sort of like force, uh, critically uh, directed at people, and then transform it in this way as a tool of uh, marginalizing. Uh, uh, Arabs and Palestinians. Is that what you saw happening? Uh, that there was this strain of, um, you know, I mean, there's there's obviously kind of almost institutionalized 
anti-Semitism in Germany now that is connected very deeply to the sense of historical guilt and, and historical reparations. But then there's also another strand in Germany of this kind of xenophobia, this anti-immigrant, anti-Arab, uh, anti-Turkish kind of uh, sentiment. Were they were they combining in the, in the, in a way? Is that uh, could you see something like this happening? Um, well, I mean, uh, yeah, I could see that. But I mean, that's something that scholars have analyzed long ago. So if you you're well read in in relation to the history of racism. Uh, in Germany, the history of uh, German colonialism in Africa, uh, the history of Nazism, and the history of the attempt by uh, German elite uh, to make it as if there is no relation between the history of Nazism and anti-Semitism and the history of uh, racial colonialism. And of course, a lot of scholars have critically shown that there is a relation. Now, uh, when we start talking about anti-Semitism, though, we have to be careful because on one hand, the historical anti-Semitism that existed in German society and that was directed towards Jewish people is still there. It's not that uh, it stopped. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, you have this new brand, so I, I, I call it kind of like a, it's like a variant of 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 the uh, virus, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they say so, so I call it anti-Semitism Z because it's created by Zionists. So it's uh, like a mutation. And of, so, so anti-Semitism yeah. Z has is not the same as anti. Semitism and to be accused of anti-Semitism, Z uh, is basically anti-Zionism, and anti. Uh, so the moment you show a critique of uh, the desire for uh, ethno-nationalism in Israel Palestine on the part of uh, uh, yeah, uh, Jews who want uh, who perceive their well-being in terms of creating an ethno-national uh, state, and you criticize this, uh, you are uh, accused of anti-Semitism Z. Mm. Uh, and so it's very important when we're criticizing the instrumentalization of anti-Semitism Z, not to fall into the trap of thinking there isn't still the real anti-Semitism uh, that is happening. Mm. And it doesn't help that uh, the nature of Zionist politics uh, in general has become uh, quite accommodating to the people who actually have a long history of actual anti-Semitism and direct their animosity towards the people who engage in anti-Semitism, the anti-Zionism. And so we have this incredible transition where on one hand we have a history of these people who are quite powerful ideologically and uh, uh, sort of like uh, militarily and uh, in terms of financial means. Uh, Sort of like, first of all, moving us to think that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. But now we've moved to this seriously kind of like strange thing where, and this is quite a fine thing, only anti-Zionism is Mm. anti-Semitism. So that is, the Zionists are quite happy to engage with all these ultra-right forces which have a long history of anti-Semitism and they don't direct the insult or the critique anti-Semitism to them, but they only direct it at people who are anti-Israeli, anti-Zionist. So only if you are anti-Zionist are you anti-Semitic in their 
you know. And uh, the anti-Semites who are still running free, not just in Germany, in France, etc. Uh, yeah, they're running free. Mm. And uh, you know, I mean, like I started uh, my my work, uh, my first book, White Nation. Uh, I actually did research with uh, Le Pen people in France and US, and no, not just in Australia. And so I have a kind of like quite an early acquaintance with these milieus of uh, white supremacist milieus. And in fact, these white supremacist milieus in Europe were far more anti-Semitic than they are in Australia or New Zealand. Uh, Like in Australia and New Zealand, the white supremacist are slightly removed from this tradition of uh, anti-Semitism. It was only when I went to Europe that I, so these people that I was studying, who were the hotbed of anti-Semitism, now uh, they are rising to power and becoming uh, respectable forces that the Israeli government is quite happy to deal with and have no problem at all. And all the animosity is directed towards those other supposed anti-Semites. I mean, I, I think, yeah, Marine Le Pen is, is a great example of that, of, of, of oh, somebody who, you yeah. know, comes from a party founded by her father, who was a Nazi himself, and deeply anti-Semitic, very vocally anti-Semitic. And at some point when she forms her policies around this idea of white nationalism and around anti-immigration, she sheds that anti-Semitism and then starts accusing her targets, the the, the young kind of uh, Arab and Muslim uh, yeah. migrants that she's targeting of anti-Semitism. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 yeah, that's why, I mean, historically. And, you know, if you want to sit down and uh, do a rational critique of this, uh, you're welcome. I've done it, everybody has done it. But uh, you come after a while to realize, you know, if uh, rationality actually is powerful against this, mm -hmm. it would have disappeared long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is they are immune from it. Uh, you know, uh, you, know you, you can throw rational arguments as much as you like at, at, at uh, say, sort of, uh, uh, you know, if you, you are experiencing hatred of uh, the Israelis, uh, you're Palestinian and you're experiencing hatred of the Israelis. Uh, after they've killed, let's say in 2014, they've killed uh, 2,000 people. And say, well, there's a tradition of anti-Semitism among, uh, among Palestinians. Mm -hmm. I say, okay, well, the rational argument, which is quite straightforward. Are you trying to tell me if somebody other than Jews killed 2,000 of your people, you would kiss them. But only because they're Jews, you are sort of like, this is what it means to say they are anti-Semitic. Uh, of course, it doesn't hold rationally, but it doesn't matter because these politics are not powerful because they're amazing of their amazing uh, rationality. Uh, they are uh, amazing because they perform a function for the people who who use them. Mm. Uh, you know, they have a practical uh, purpose, not a rational purpose. It's a trap we academics fall into often when we start thinking that uh, the whole world is like one large tutorial. <laughs> Uh, so sort of like, let's have an interesting discussion. Right. And, uh, oh, no, I agree, I disagree with you. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like saying, uh, so I treat that in my book, uh, is racism an environmental threat? Mm. Uh, because when someone uses an animalistic uh, metaphor to be racist, I say, uh, sort of like, uh, Palestinians are cockroaches. Uh, Muslims are rats. You know, you wouldn't go and say, actually, no, they're not. Uh, let me uh, show you rationally <laughs> that they are not. <laughs>
I mean, it doesn't make sense. Well, rats are important to society. <laughs> rats and are sort of like, ecology. let me take yeah. the measurement of the rat and the yeah. cockroach and the shape and the genetic makeup to show you that right. uh, they are not. Of course you don't. Because you understand that's not because the intention. Okay, so, but, the, but the reason they are saying it has a practical function. I mean, and that's that's what I studied in 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 that book because that was the transition from seeing the Muslim as as cockroach to the Muslim as wolf, and so like I said, the usage of the metaphor of wolf and wolf, and so you know, if you're referring to someone as a cockroach, you want to squash them. If you're referring to someone as wolf, you don't squash wolves. Uh, you see them as enemies, a threat, uh, a completely you different uh, imagination. So the racist imagination is a functional imagination. By, by studying it, you realize what are the intentions of the people who are using it. And the intentions are practical. They're not about knowing better. Or, so there's no point sitting with these people and say, no, actually, let me explain to you things, uh, etc. Mm. So... I think, I mean, to that point that there, there was um, uh, very quickly and in, in, the, in the days and weeks after October 7th, there was this um, explosion of um, Islamophobic and racist tropes in the way that the Palestinian issue was being covered um, in a lot of the media narratives and a lot of the front pages of tabloid press. Um, and it was language that was very reminiscent of the early days of the war on terror. And there was kind of a moment that I had where I was surprised at how shocked I was that this kind of language still persisted in the media and the official language of politicians, because I had assumed that we had kind of evolved from this or kind of moved past this kind of very initial um, image of like the the barbarism and the hordes and the and the um, the Stone Age people that you know wouldn't weren't civilized. All of that language was there, and it surfaced very quickly. Uh, how do you see that? How do you see this this kind of um, uh, this this resurgence of all of this imagery that has been used in a lot of moments to demonize not just people in Gaza and Palestinians, but also the you know the the pro Palestinian marches. Uh, we've seen the way that uh, officials in the UK, for for example, have not shied away from using deeply Islamophobic language to describe yeah. these people. Look, I mean, there's there's two dimensions to this, in as far as I'm concerned. On one hand, it's a resurgence, as you said, but if you look at its uh, intensity and uh, at its uh, tone, uh, you'll notice that there is a little difference. And uh, there is a difference between, if you like, colonial racism and post-colonial racism, or colonial white racism and post-colonial white uh, racism. I think uh, there is an element in which uh, post-colonial whiteness sees itself as uh, lacking compared to colonial whiteness. It imagines itself that it looks at colonial racism uh, nostalgically. <laughs> it says it kind of like, you know, in the technically in theories of nostalgia, nostalgia means not just that you yearn for a past, but you yearn for a past that never really existed. Mm -hmm. Make a maker great again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there's this kind of white racist post-colonial imagination, which often imagines where were the good old days when we whites just were ruled. A kind of slave imaginary, with some people by being racist. As I said, this is the imagination because I'm sure the slaves weren't thumped as, as they think uh, they were by racism. But there is this imagination that racism was more efficient keeping racialized people in their place. It was more confident. Yeah, and more powerful and more able, and the racialized were more obedient. And so uh, so the racism that we have now is a bit desperate because it kind of feels 
why isn't my racism working? Why do these colored people and Arab people, etc., they actually are not even scared of me. Uh, and they want to protest and uh, uh, they don't buy it when I look at them in a, they, as if they're inferior, they tell me to piss off. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my, it's, uh, you know, uh, psychoanalytically, it's like an experience of defalicization in the sense of you, you compare your, your penis with the penis of your dad and you say, oh no, my penis is not as big as my dad's penis. And so it's a bit like this, like it's my racism is not as good as my the racism, racism of my ancestors. Mm. Uh, and so that comes with this anxiety and this anxiety colors these categorizations. So there is the resurgence of the category, but when you listen to the timber of the voice that is, that is actually doing the racism, you find a lot of insecurity. Mm. Uh, and uh, and uh, the, because of this insecurity, it always has a higher potential for violence, you know, uh, because uh, here violence comes from the desire for violence, comes from a perception that your words are not achieving what they ought to achieve. It's like a bit like a uh, you know a violent patriarch towards your violent towards your wife it's a sign of your weakness mm. because you are not able to rule by word mm. alone and this is how people are perceived in traditional settings no one respects someone who is violent towards it's not the norm of patriarchy like it's the same. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Your authority is sort of like uh, not, not so uh, there, so to speak. Uh, yeah. So uh, in in Lebanese Arabic, I don't know if it's in other Arabics. Uh, you have what's called wahra, wahra, and someone who has wahra, it means he oozes authority. Mm -hmm. So, so a uh, chief who appears is a shual wahra. It means when you appear, everybody wants to obey you because you ooze an aura of authority. It's about an aura of authority. And uh, so I think uh, today we have uh, a white racism bala wahra with no aura of authority whatsoever. And so, so it's a bit of joke, but at the same time, it's lethal because they're powerful people. It's not that they are not powerful people. They're, the difference is is not between powerful and non-powerful people. The difference is between secure powerful people and insecure powerful people. That's what we have now. That's really interestingly put. And, and so when you look at a context like a lot of Western countries right now, a lot of European countries, but specifically countries like Germany, where you are seeing this kind of um, uh, this um, crackdown on voices that are perceived to be, you know, officially anti-Semitic, um, anti-Zionist, anti-Israeli, but it is happening within a context of a society that is on paper supposed to value freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. How do you read what's happening there? Well, again, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of uh, critical historiography, which shows very clearly that the the nice space of democracy, the space that we fantasize about as being really nice, everybody's egalitarian, uh, uh, the state uh, treats everybody as a citizen, uh, uh, 
people like to debate, uh, they don't bash each other, uh, everybody sort of like have decent arguments of uh, uh, latte and uh, etc. This space was historically dependent on a violent colonial space. So uh, to enjoy your cup of tea in London, you needed violence in India. And what was the essence of the enjoyment was the ability to separate the two spaces so that you don't realize the link between your enjoyment of the cup of tea in London and the violence that's being done in India. Now, there are societies where this was much more difficult to achieve, which are colonial settler societies, because the violence and the nice space are close to each other. So it's not the colony out there. In Australia, you were colonizing and you were wanted a space of enjoyment and they weren't. One is in India and one, it was both of them there. Uh, New Zealand, the same way. Uh, Israel, it's the same way. So the art of actually immunizing a nice space from the violence that is necessary for the formation of this nice place is uh, much harder in the settler colony. But what's more, we are seeing a general breakdown of this ability to keep the two spaces separate. So I don't think the question is that uh, we had democracy and now we have less democracy. I see it that the lack of democracy that used to be enclosed and safely pushed away has seeped into the metropolis. Mm. And the ability to distinguish between any place and a place where it's not democratic, it's violent, etc. The two spaces are starting to yeah, mix and fuse with each other. Mm -hmm. So we see more. It's like, uh, you know, uh, there was a, an interesting moment where this uh, African asylum seeker uh, hid in the wheel of a plane, the where, where the wheel sits, and the plane took off, and he obviously froze, and he fell in the middle of this neat bourgeois English suburb, mm. and and suddenly the violence of asylum seekers etc., which was there, sort of like landed in the middle of, of the suburb. And so we are increasingly seeing situations like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so the violence that was over there is now over here. And uh, the person who was uh, reliant on the suppression of the violence over there to project themselves as amazingly wonderful and neat and beautiful and democratic suddenly find themselves unable to do so and you scratch them and you find this authoritarian mm. thing popping up uh, all the time yeah. and and so so you have in germany you can see that in france you can see that uh, all the democratic uh, institutions uh, you see flashes often turning into exactly their opposite. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I treat a lot that in my, in my own uh, field work. This idea of sort of like uh, uh, a migrant goes to the bank, let's say, to do a transaction. And it's easy to fall into uh, thinking, okay, I'm just a normal citizen going 
to the bank, which is a nice bank that treats everyone nicely. And everything is happening like this, but suddenly you notice that the gaze of the teller, just for a moment, was racist. Like it doesn't have to be dramatic. Yeah. Just that split second flash where racism intrudes into the niceness of the whole bank and etc. And suddenly you realize that there's more to this than, than just the facade. And uh, the whole state is like this because it's most all European states are on one hand egalitarian democratic states but also there are white supremacist states and white supremacy flashes out of them every now and then it hits you and and it would be wrong to say use that flash to say no there's no democracy there's only racism because the difficulty is that they both coexist it is true that the state is democratic and it is true that a lot of migrants enjoy in fact the fact that they go to England, they come to Australia and they say, you know, it's so amazing. I can go to, to a government office and I get what I want without needing some bloody Zaim or chef to, to intercede. I feel I'm treated in my own right. People experience this all the time. So it's not a false experience. There is something better and democratic. But then you get that flash of racism that reminds you that it's not just that the state is also a white supremacist mm -hmm. state that can put you down, take away your rights, etc. And now you see it uh, in uh, how a citizenship, which used to be some a sacrosanct category, you know, once you're a citizen, you're a citizen. And now suddenly you say, well, we're going to take it away from you. I don't like you. <laughs> uh, um, so this is the opposite of the democratic state, which gives you your right as a as a citizen. Mm -hmm. If I can ask you about your own experience, um, so you you know you're you're talking about how uh, initially you weren't you know you're not on the front lines of protests. You're not you're not kind of directly engaging with it. You are focusing on the work that you're doing at the Max Planck Institute, uh, and then at some point that changes. You you no. begin to speak out. No. What no. changes then? What nothing changes cha in your Nothing mind? changes. What changes is that a uh, right-wing newspaper, uh, Die Welt am Sonntag, uh, The World on Sunday, uh, they uh, decided to do research, which they call research, which is basically, basically uh, snooping at my Facebook and taking quotes uh, and uh, they sent me this letter in which they quote from my facebook copiously and say and said uh, do you understand that if someone read this they think you are an anti-semite this is this was the message i got I mean, I've had years of dealing with right-wing journalists when I worked on white supremacy, when I worked on Israel-Palestine. I know that there's no point replying because they just use whatever to say what they want to say, but add quotes from you to say it. So I didn't reply, but I immediately contacted the directors of uh, the institute and said, there's going to be an assassination job done on me. And you I felt think, like something was coming. Oh, I knew, I knew. I knew. I said, that would be publishing and attacking me. It's part of what everyone has been sort of like, uh, sort of like, copying it in Germany, um, I'll, I'll copy it. Uh, you know, the, if you are, I mean, it's part of me being a fighter, what I do on, on, on my social media, and uh, it's part of your ethos as a fighter. You don't complain if your enemy lands 
a blow against you, there's no point you whinging about it. Okay, so you're fighting, and if they win, they win, but you, you have to get up and fight again. So I'm not kind of like that concerned. Okay, so they land the blow, they land the blow. And so I told them, but so, uh, but what happened, it turned out, is that not only had they sent me this uh, letter, they had sent it to Munich, to the president of Max Planck Society, that is the society which overlooks all the Max Planck uh, institutes. And uh, the guy uh, basically gave it to some lawyers, and some lawyers uh, immediately decided that, oh my God, look what this guy says in his uh, Facebook. Uh, this is definitely anti-Semitic. Uh, we we don't we can't cope with it here. In Max Planck, they informed uh, the directors of the Anthropology Institute that they needed to terminate. Um, their relation with me. And so, and uh, the president offered me a, I don't know what made him think that, <laughs> but he kind of like offered me a no disclosure agreement and said, look, just go uh, take your wages and go. And, uh, and I kind of like was totally incensed and I said, no, sack me. Uh, I want you to sack me because I want to be, I want you to produce a historical document which says why uh, you sacked me because I am so confident that this will shame you. It will not shame me. Uh, my history uh, speaks for itself. I'm sure you're not going to damage it, and this, this is what happened. And the, the the they did put out put out a statement, and the statement I mean, doesn't reveal much, but it says something along the lines of some of the the, the things that you have been saying or sharing were incompatible, incompatible. with the core it, values. It's of the, so the that was that was fine. I could have lived with that because the statement had that part which says it's incompatible. Because incompatible, sure, if they think if they think something and I'm incompatible, it's tough. But then they finished it with the statement there is no place for racism, anti Semitism and Islamophobia and Max Planck, which was like an implication that I engage in, I mean, it's, it's a sort of like, you know, uh, I mean, I'm 67, I was gonna make it sort of like completely without having to deal with this bullshit. <laughs> and so, so, so it has come late in life for me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I felt, no, you know, uh, I'm in a secure position, uh, my job, in Australia is secure, uh, my reputation is secure. Uh, if I'm not gonna make things difficult for these people, who is? <laughs> so I decided, okay, that's it. I mean, you know, if nothing else, we would have made things a little bit more difficult for them. Yeah. So with win, lose, it doesn't matter. And uh, I mean, so you you obviously have chosen the path of of resistance, um, and uh, you have been speaking out uh, about it, and you sharing your own thoughts, and you've received um, quite a considerable number of, of support letters and, and statements. Some some people, um, some of your colleagues at the institute or, or, or other places, have reached out to the uh, the, the leadership of the the society and, and spoken to them. Um, and I don't know how much you can talk about what steps you're taking now, but uh, I mean, share with us what you can. Well, I can't share anything because not partly, partly not because I'm into legalese, but because I uh, basically my my lawyer has lodged uh, an unfair dismissal uh, thing. I looked at it and it's totally incomprehensible for me. It's just full of <laughs> <laughs> legal full of jargon, legal jargon, yeah. sort of like. 
And uh, according to German law, uh, what I understand is that uh, the employee has two weeks to respond uh, to this. And I think uh, the action will will uh, start or not start according to what the reaction will be. And then, what do you hope to to get out of this? I mean, would you, Would you like to go back to the uh, to, to the institute, or or are you trying to make a uh, a point um, of of the way that they had dismissed you? Well, I mean, I, I can only take two years leave without pay uh, from Melbourne University, so that's roughly over. So there's no point me sort of like uh, thinking of staying uh, longer. I've already stayed about a year and a half. So it doesn't make sense, but I definitely want uh, or wish to uh, sort of like, well, uh, frankly, I just wish uh, to make it uh, less easy for this destructive uh, usage of anti-Semitism. I want to make it less easy for people to engage in it. Uh, because I genuinely believe uh, it hurts, obviously, it hurts people, uh, Arab people, Palestinian people, but it uh, hurts also Jewish people who are uh, subjected to, uh, to anti-Semitism. Uh, you know, I mean, like at one point I was talking to someone uh, very naively uh, at the beginning of when this happened, and I said, uh, should I should I should I say that I'm married to a Jewish person, uh, and uh, you know uh, my wife's father is an Italian Jew who had to escape Mussolini and come to Australia, so she's the daughter of an escapee of fascism. And uh, this German guy looks at me and said, you know, I'm sorry to tell you, but. These people lecture the sons and daughters of the Holocaust about what the Holocaust and what anti-Semitism is. I don't think just being married to a Jewish person, person is going is to save you uh, from, from anything. And so, but, but at the same time, you know, it's to say that I am uh, personally linked uh, through my wife to actual history of anti-Semitism and I have an interest in fighting actual anti-Semitism and not uh, letting people get away with diverting it uh, in the way uh, they have diverted it. Do you think this this uh, changes the, the, the way that you approach your work as an anthropologist? Not really. Not really. I try to create a very uh, distinct space. Uh, you will see from my writing that I don't encourage that much what I call the colonization of the academic by the political. Uh, I like to do politics, but I like academics to maintain some autonomy so that if they contribute to the political, it will be something else, something in addition to political space, not subservient to the need uh, of, of, uh, of politics. And in fact, uh, so if, uh, just before that that happened, uh, and I put it on on my Facebook because people are interested in reading about it, uh, one of my colleagues had sent me an email and said, uh, "Son, I'm starting to teach first year anthropology this year, and I wonder what do you think? How should I change the curriculum?" Uh, in order to uh, uh, make it uh, relevant uh, in relation to what's happening uh, in Gaza. Mm. And I said, I actually don't believe that you should uh, change the curriculum. I believe you should emphasize those aspects uh, uh, in the anthropological tradition, which say one basic thing about anthropology is you learn how to get out of yourself to understand 
other spaces which are very different from you. And I think if students get this idea that it is important to get out of yourself and not be narcissistic and just think about yourself but understand others, that's already a politics against the narcissism of ethno-nationalism that you see in Zionism and in certain forms of Islamic fundamentalism as well, right? Hassan Hajj, uh, thank you very much for being here with us. Um, this was a really uh, eye-opening interview and uh, best of luck for, I mean, your fight, <laughs> um, but also, but also, you know, returning to Australia and, and continuing your work. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. I thought. Thank you for watching this episode of The Big Picture and a big thank you to our guest today, Hassan Hajj. We want to hear what you think about this conversation, so please let us know your thoughts below in the comments. Also, let us know what guests you'd like us to talk to next. As always, you can listen to this podcast and this interview wherever you get your podcasts from. And until next time, Salam.